scores aren't open. So I think they um, are prepped to understand um, what's going on at the airport. Then uh, after we talk to them, we've left a lot of time for Q&A. You can write them in the chat or ra raise your hand as Leanne said. And I think we can ask questions specifically around airport concessionaires. But the reason we have Congresswoman Shalala on the phone is I do believe, and she and I have I've already had several discussions, that the federal bill did a great job at helping the big airlines, right, keep flying and spreading money um, to lots of small businesses. But some shops in the airport, the shops are small and don't have 500 employees, uh, but if they happen to have shops in multiple airports, they have uh, been left out of any of the federal recovery money. So if you have questions about that or ideas you'd like to feed into the Congresswoman, that's why she's here. Uh, we also, I think, have our airport director um, also here. Uh, so if you have questions for him later on, Lester's also on the phone. Lester, do I see you? Let me get my right view up here. Um, I, oh, yeah. I, I, see, you I see you, Commissioner. Hi. Hi, Lester. Good uh, afternoon, Congresswoman. All right, so why don't I um, turn it over to um, Althea Harris, who can give us um, all the information we need to know from the SBA uh, here in um, South Florida. I think you have a presentation, so watch I do. and share. Yes. Um, Forgive me, folks. Uh, I do not uh, believe in the myth of multitasking. So just give me a moment. Here, I unmuted myself. Now I'm going to try and share my screen. There we go. Oh, and then hit share. Okay. I'm, I'm going to fly through these uh, a little bit because I want to make sure that we have um, time for questions. Uh, but I, as, as uh, Commissioner Higgins said, and I want to thank you very much for including SBA um, uh, today. Of course, we are the lead agency that is um, administering uh, much of the disaster relief uh, through our uh, longstanding program, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, and the new uh, programs that came out of the CARES Act. I'm laughing at myself because I am in my laundry room and I hit my, um, I, I messed something up and now it's all falling apart. But anyway, so economic injury disaster loan, the overview is um, this program has been around for decades uh, at the SBA and we utilize this economic injury disaster loan program to help small businesses meet their monthly fixed obligations that they would ordinarily be able to pay except for the disaster has taken place. So those uh, fixed expenses are things like payroll or your accounts payable and any other bills uh, that you might have on a rolling uh, monthly basis. Now the good thing about SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is it tends to have a long window of opportunity to apply. So right now, uh, small businesses, nonprofits, even faith institutions can apply for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan uh, up until December 18th of this year. The cap on the loan is $2 million. Obviously, everyone will not qualify for $2 million. The interest rate on these loans is 3.75% for business owners and 2.75% for nonprofits. The term can be as long as 30 years. These loans are designed to help you uh, recover from a disaster, but not crush you uh, with um, high loan payments, and that's what monthly loan payments, and that's why uh, the term can be as long as 30 years. You may not get a term of 30 years, uh, but the program does allow for that much. Now, the CARES Act, which was uh, passed by the Congress uh, two weeks ago tomorrow and signed by President Trump, uh, allows for an e advance, a loan advance on the economic injury disaster loan uh, up to $10,000 that does not have to be repaid 
provided it's utilized as expected, which is to say to pay your business expenses. If the funds are not utilized correctly, then um, uh, you will not be eligible or you would jeopardize your ability to get additional funds from SBA. The point of the loan advance is to provide quick economic relief to businesses uh, who are experiencing uh, obviously difficulties now because of the coronavirus. Now the uh, CARES Act uh, requires that we dispense the monies in the form of the loan advance within three days of a successful application. But a successful application is not made when you hit submit. It's um, successful when we have approved it. Uh, in, for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, you must have credit that is acceptable to SBA. Now, we obviously understand that things uh, have gone totally sideways because of the pandemic. Uh, but we and we don't have a, a number uh, score that we look for uh, on credit uh, reports. However, SBA will be looking at your credit history in its entirety to determine acceptability. And I always say to folks, look, don't look at your own uh, credit score or report and convince yourself not to apply for this loan. SBA's goal and desire is to say yes. So don't say no for us by not applying, okay? Uh, normally and under normal circumstances, SBA uh, does look to see if you can repay the loan. These are not normal circumstances. So uh, the, I don't really know what we're doing about repayment ability because right now everybody uh, is uh, struggling with their cash flow. Um, Businesses must be located in the United States um, because the entire United States has been declared for this disaster. Uh, loans under $25,000 do not require collateral. Collateral is not a deal breaker for SBA, uh, but if you do have collateral, you're expected to pledge it. Um, you should know that these funds come directly from the federal government. So, uh, it, and it is a loan, so it must be repaid, except for that uh, $10,000 loan advance. Um, there is no obligation to take the loan if it is offered to you. Uh, SBA could offer you more than you want. SBA could offer you less than you want. If it, we offer you more than you want, you can uh, you know, decline to take that much. If we've offered you less than you want, you can ask for a loan modification. So this is not a high pressure situation uh, where we're gonna force you to take the money. You can take your time and think about uh, the obligation. Uh, it's really important to know that you can have an existing disaster loan with SBA. For example, maybe you received an SBA disaster loan for physical damage to your property uh, because of Hurricane Irma. That is not a disqualifier from having a loan under the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, nor is having a, a regular SBA 7A loan. That is not a disqualifier. You can have an SBA loan, an SBA dis physical disaster loan. You can have an SBA uh, economic injury disaster loan. You can have the PPP loan, which I'll discuss next. You can have all of these loans all at the same time, provided you know you can uh, repay them ideally. Uh, and if you can stand it, you can have it. And as long as your uh, total aggregate amount is less than $5 million. Okay. If you previously applied for an SBA economic injury disaster loan and you were denied, please go back to our website, sba.gov, and uh, make application so that we can reconsider uh, that decision. Eligible entities for the economic injury disaster loan are small businesses uh, with 500 employees or less, 1099 uh, employees, sole proprietors. Uh, most private nonprofits organized under sections 501C, D, and E. Uh, 
faith-based organizations are now also eligible as well as agricultural cooperatives. The ineligible folks are agricultural enterprises, gambling concerns, casinos and racetracks, and real estate developers are not eligible under this program either. And real estate developers are folks who uh, purchase property uh, primarily and engage in subdividing that property. They're not eligible. As I mentioned, uh, private nonprofits are eligible. Uh, to apply, again, you go to our website, sba.gov forward slash disaster. Uh, on the screen is our 800 number, 800-659-2955. So if you have questions, you can uh, attempt to get answers from that phone number, or you can email service at sba.gov. As you might expect, uh, we are experiencing a lot of high volume uh, in application to this program. So um, under normal circumstances, SBA takes about 18 to 21 days to respond to a, an application for economic injury disaster loans. Of course, this is not normal uh, circumstances. So uh, if you apply for the program through our website, you really should not expect an answer uh, in any amount of time less than that. Um, but, oh, another thing, when you apply for this program, you will see uh, on the streamlined application a request for your uh, banking and routing numbers. That is legitimate. You did not fall into a phishing trap or anything like that. We are asking you for that because SBA gives the disaster money through electronic funds transfers. You can get help with all of this in terms of pulling together your financial records, preparing your financial statements and submitting your loan application from our resource partners. And thankfully, we have the Small Business Development Center uh, right here with us tonight, Brian Van Hook, uh, runs the center at FIU. They are a wonderful group of people committed to helping you. They are high quality experts who can assist you in this process. You can likewise get help from our SCORE chapters, our Women's Business Centers, and the Veterans Business Outreach Centers. Certainly local chambers of commerce have been very helpful to their members uh, trying to add value in this process and are also helping folks. Now, I'll quickly go through the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which I'm sure uh, most folks are very interested in. Again, this came out of the CARES Act um, and provides $349 billion uh, to help uh, employers bring back uh, any employees they may have had to lay off or reduce their hours because of the pandemic. These are forgivable loans if used appropriately. And that is if you uh, keep uh, your employees on the payroll for eight weeks after you get the money from a bank. The Paycheck Protection Program is available through June 30th or until the money runs out. All small biz businesses are eligible. This is a loan though it is forgivable. If you do not obtain forgiveness for the loan, it is a loan with a maturity rate of two years and an interest rate of 1%. There's no need to make payments in the first six months. There are no, there are no collateral requirements nor personal guarantees. There are also no fees, not on the Paycheck Protection Program nor on SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. So Anybody asks you for fees, run and then tell on them uh, because there are no fees allowed to be collected on any of these programs. The loans from the PPP program covers your expenses dating back from February 15th going forward to June 30th. Again, this loan is 100% forgivable if you use the funds appropriately. Uh, I mentioned that who's eligible, and you have to have been in business before February 15th. 
the way you apply is through an SBA 7A lender. Those are lenders who are very familiar with SBA's regular loan programs for businesses. They have the infrastructure needed to make uh, the process go quickly, ideally. Now, as you might expect, there's a high demand for these loans. So the Treasury has been approving additional um, financial institutions who can do these loans. And so they've included uh, federally insured, uh, uh, what do they call it, credit unions, uh, federally insured deposit institutions, and they say they are bringing additional uh, financial institutions on every day. Um, we are making the suggestion that you go with your business banker. However, if your bank is one of the large national banks, it's quite possible, and if you've heard any, you know, been paying attention to the news, it's quite possible that your business bank may not be uh, taking any more applications or they may have additional requirements uh, on uh, applications. So one good piece of news I've heard, or two actually, is that the smaller banks have been making these loans successfully and borrowers who have gone to banks who hold their mortgages have been successful in obtaining these PPP loans. Now, last Friday, sole proprietors and small business owners could apply for the PPP program with their bank. This is money that comes from the federal government, but it's uh, moving through the financial institution, okay? Sole proprietors and 1099 employees uh, can start applying tomorrow. You're going to have to show your payroll documentation. No one's taking your word for it. You have to show us how much you spend on an average monthly basis in 2019 for your payroll costs. You'll have to bring that to your lender. They may ask you for additional documents. They're very likely to ask you for additional documents, like your two years of tax returns, both personal and business. They'll ask you for your current financial statements. They'll ask you for your profit and loss statement for 2019, especially if you haven't filed your taxes yet for 2019. So you'll have to uh, document your need for payroll uh, monies. And the loan application is based on your average monthly payroll for 2019 times 2.5. Now, uh, up to a maximum of $10 million. What I, if your business did not exist before June 30th of 2019, the lender is gonna look at your cost in January and February of 2020. So there's going to be a requirement to show documents. And I take this time now to say, please, 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 with all of these loan programs, document accurately, clearly and simply how you're utilizing the monies. You may not, you may not use economic injury disaster loan money. You may not use PPP money. You may not collect unemployment for the exact same payroll costs or employee costs at the same time. So it's really important that you manage these funds well, because again, with the PPP, uh, these loans are forgivable, but only if you do it correctly. Now, payroll costs include salaries, wages, commissions, or tips that you pay to your employees, but they're capped. You can, if you have an employee who makes $150,000, you can only use up to 100,000 of that employee's uh, uh, payroll in the calculation, all right? So uh, for 1099 contractors and sole proprietors, you can use uh, your wages, your commissions, your income, your net earnings. I don't wanna spend too much time, but I do wanna make sure we have um, time for your questions. Okay, now about the loan forgiveness, this is important. 
a minimum of 75% of the PPP loan is expected to be used for payroll and employee costs. You can use 100% of it for payroll, or you can use up to 25% of it on other than payroll for mortgage interest payments, rent and lease payments, and utility payments that were due and owing as before February 15th, 2020. If you use 30% for these certain other expenses, and let me do the math, 70% on payroll, 70% will be forgiven if you do everything the way you're supposed to, but 5%, that 5% over 25% that you use for something else will not be forgiven. So stick to the guidelines. It's really important. Um, we talked about this already, and I just want to share a couple more slides with you quickly. Uh, the CARES Act also provided for debt relief uh, for folks who already have 7A loans with the SBA or who obtained new 7A loans this year before September 27th, 2020, SBA will pay the principal and interest on your loan for a period of six months. Also, if you have an SBA disaster loan for physical damage, for example, for Hurricane Irma, you do not have to make those monthly payments. I think it's through the end of the year. The whole point is that we'll ease your cash flow burdens uh, on, for 2020 to help you get back on, uh, on track with your business. And lastly, the Express Bridge Loan Program is a pilot program that allows small businesses who already have a business relationship with an SBA Express lender to access up to $25,000 uh, in a streamlined, less paperwork fashion. And again, it's to help you uh, get some quick cash in your business to meet some of your, the expenses and demands of your business. Now, if you also apply for the economic injury disaster loan while you apply for this express bridge loan, you, SBA will take some of the proceeds of the economic injury disaster loan and pay off this loan. Because bridge loans are meant to be short-term financing that helps you in the short term, but it becomes uh, problematic with if it turns into long-term debt. So SBA doesn't want you to have that problem. So we'll take proceeds from the economic injury disaster loan and pay off your bridge loan. So that's what I wanted to briefly get through and, to, and share with you all this evening. Um, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. So I'll pass it back to you, Commissioner. Great. Well, thanks. This is my first briefing on small business loans from the laundry room. So that's very <laughs> exciting. Thanks, Althea. Um, okay, we will, um, I think, turn it over to Brian Van Hook to um, give us um, all of the help that they can be doing for us from, from FIU, because uh, they're actually, his group is providing great client service. Uh, to many people to get their very specific business questions answered um, and help figuring out filing the documents. I applied for one for a small business I had and it took some time. So go ahead, Brian, thanks. All right, well, thank you, Commissioner, um, for organizing this. Thank you to your team. I also wanna thank the Congresswoman for being on as well. Um, and I would say between both of you guys, um, you guys are getting out really good information. I was joking before, I'm always on the Congresswoman's town halls because she has really good health information. So if I wanna know what's going on in the public health and you know all that, I go on her town halls. Um, so it's good to have her on. Um, and if I, if I wouldn't log off early anyway, but now that she's the closer, I will not log off, I will stay on. Um, but as uh, the commissioner mentioned and as Althea mentioned, um, we are the Small Business Development Center program. Um, we are located under FIU's College of Business here in Miami. If you pay federal and state taxes, you don't need to do a show of hands. Um, but if you pay federal and state taxes, then we are your SBDC. Um, we have a team of business specialists and we focus on one-on-one -on -one business consulting. And the best part is it's no cost to you guys. I don't say free because I have to pay my employees. I have to pay 
the consultants to work with you. And also it's a kind of a partnership. We have both have to put in time. Um, so there is a cost to it that we're paying for, but there's no cost to you, the business owner. And when skies are blue, when we don't have COVID-19 or Zika or hurricanes, um, we focus on business growth. We want to help you get a loan. We want to help you get a contract. We want to help you export. We want to help you hire more employees. We want to help you increase your revenues. Um, but obviously I cannot do any of that if you are closed, if your lights are off, if your employees are not on payroll. So like a lot of groups like Althea, we're focused on helping with the disaster response. And right now we're really hustling because the number one through number 10 priority for businesses is cash flow, as the commissioner mentioned, is capital to you know pay debts, pay utilities, um, pay employees most importantly. So we're focused on, as we say, kind of navigating the alphabet soup for you and finding between PPP, between EIDL, between e EBLs. Um, so what I'd rather do is I don't have fancy slides like Althea, um, but I, what I would like to do is just kind of give you the roadmap, kind of the overview on what programs are available and kind of what's out there and, and some tips. And then like Althea, I want to save a lot of time for questions. Um, so the first program I would mention was Althea mentioned the SBA Express Bridge Loan Program. There is a Florida Emergency Bridge Loan Program that's available through the state of Florida. Um, the, basically the loan is for a one year term, no interest, um, no collateral. It goes up to $50,000. In special circumstances, you can get up to $100,000. This program traditionally has been used to bridge the gap between when you, the disaster happens and when you get an SBA loan, when you get insurance, when profits pick back up. Um, so that program is a really good program. Generally, it's run locally. So what we do is the state of Florida provides the funding. The local SBDCs operate lo local loan committees of bankers and economic development officials, and we process the applications. Um, usually, this program works super quick. We can, from the time I get a completed application until I can get uh, funds in your account, it's 10 to 14 days. Obviously, this is very unprecedented. I think for the state, I think they got about 20,000 applications, um, and we're not like the SBA. We don't have $200 billion behind the program. So if I would kind of give you that caveat, if you did not apply already, if you applied later on, it's gonna to be tough to get some funding from that program because for our center, we're doing the fair thing. We're working from the application date and also from the date of receipt. So we're fair to everybody. We're not like taking our friends and moving them ahead of the line or anything. Um, but that program is really good. We've actually got out, I wanna say about $1.5 million. That's actually money in people's accounts so far. We're trying to hustle and get out as much as we can, um, but that's a really good program. And actually what you do for that program is you get the bridge loan and then you eventually roll it into an SBA disaster loan or PPP if you're gonna use a portion of it for that um, or other loans, but you have a year to pay it off. Um, for So that's the bridge loan program. For the economic injury disaster loan program, I'll be a mention, it's a long-standing program, 3.75% for businesses, up to a 30-year term. Um, you can basically get up to $25,000 without collateral. They do have the $10,000 um, that they'll offer you for, like, if you have 10 employees, it's like, I think it's a $1,000 per employee up to 10. Um, we know a lot of people that have applied. We don't know anybody. As I said on the call today, that's actually got the ideal money. But I would say that is a long-term program. And at least from what I heard that the $10,000 program, it opened on April 1st. They said you should have funds within 14 days. So we're at um, April 9th as we are today. Um, so I'm expecting maybe some funds to come out next week. Uh, but definitely you should get your um, loan application number because that's the number, it, it either starts with a two or a three. You're gonna basically call the customer service. You can email, you can check for a status. They don't have an online way to check it. But if you have that number that starts with the two or three, that's how you can check on your status for your EIDL. What I would ask, encourage you to do too, is I'll, I'll be a mention. Once you're approved, you don't have to take the money. You don't have to take all the money. You only pay interest on what you draw down. So let's say you want to take the 25,000 that you can get without collateral. You can take that. You're only going to pay interest on that. Let's say you need another 125,000. You would only pay interest on that 150,000 that you've drawn down. You can keep the rest in reserve. Um, also, as Althea mentioned, if you've been declined, you have the opportunity to appeal. You get a letter from SBA 
You have, I want to say, six months from the day that you get that appeal letter to appeal. A lot of times it's just that you need more information. You need to submit more documentation, more things. Groups like SBDC, we can help you with that appeal. Um, if you get denied again, you can actually appeal again. Um, so you have two kind of ways to appeal it. And I would encourage you to do it because sometimes it's based on your financials and sometimes the financials improve or you can provide additional documentation. Um, also, do not request a loan modification now. Wait till you're approved to request a loan modification. If you request a loan modification now, God bless you. Um, you, you can get your money at some point, but that will take a lot longer. My suggestion is wait till you're approved, then you can request a loan modification. As Althea said, you can request less money, you can request more money. We've helped a lot of businesses because there was a delay between when they were approved and when they got the money. Obviously, they had additional economic impact. So we're like, we can help you. Mainly, you need to write a letter, and we can help groups like SBDC can help you with the letter. And also, you need to provide some uh, financial information to back up what you're saying. They can give you additional money. Um, and for economic injury disaster loans, it's a good program. I would say it's up to 30 year term, 3.75%. That's a really good deal. What we've been encouraging folks is PPP is primarily for payroll costs. As Althea mentioned, you can use, get up to 75% forgiven if you follow all the rules and you use it for payroll. 25% you can use for other costs. My suggestion, like I always say, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. I would tell you what I would do if I was you. If I was you, I would put all my non-payroll stuff under the idle if you're approved for that, because that's a way you can use more. And actually for the idle, you might get more money. Um, and then it's 30 years to pay it off. For the PPP loan, remember, you can get it forgiven. If you use anything outside of the rules or not like outside of the 75%, it's a two year term loan. Basically it's 1% interest, but just be aware of that. Just like I would say for the bridge loan, the bridge loan is one year. After a year, interest starts accruing. So you need to pay it in full. Um, for PPP, um, basically a lot of the big banks are not accepting more applications. As Althea said, if you were first you should go to your bank go to your banker go to your bank see if they're going to allow you i know a lot of the big banks you have to apply online um if you go to your bank and they de they decline you they won't they won't let you apply if they're not going to let make you a loan for covid 19 why do you want to bank with them when things are nice this is this is when you need the capital this is when you need the help as althea mentioned sba has these community banks that are participating in the program They've also basically doubled the number of uh, 7A lenders that they, they usually have. That's a lot of local banks, that's credit unions, um, other organizations. A lot of the community banks are the ones that are making the loans. And right now, they're poaching a lot of the clients. I'm not gonna mention who they're poaching clients from, but they would be the big banks you know. And they're doing a good job. But be aware, they're not doing it altruistically. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They want your business. They want you as a client. So what they might ask you for, which, what I would say you're going to have to do, is you're going to have to take your deposits from the bank that's not making you the loan and take your deposits, whether that's a commercial or banking account, take that to the, ne the next bank. That's the incentive. Also, the incentive is the 1% interest that basically if you have to pay the, the two-year um, term. But we've heard from a lot of uh, businesses that are having success with those community banks or credit unions. Um, so I would encourage you to, sh to shop around. Um, but I would encourage you don't make a ton of applications because that could hurt your application that could um, hurt your status. You should work one or you should basically reach out to that bank and basically let them know that you're not interested in pursuing it because then that way you can basically start with somebody else. Um, and we're waiting to see because I know that the Congress is discussing adding additional funding to the program uh, for PPP. So I think that that's going to Kind of incentivize some more banks and get some more applications out um, but i would say the ppp is a really good program and it's structured very well and um, for me i look at ppp it's not a new program they created from scratch it's using the existing 7a loan structure it's using existing 7a lenders but be aware that if you're not a client of the bank they're going to ask you for that additional documentation the reason why the banks are going with existing clients is because they know you they already have your documentation. They don't have to do OFAC reviews. They don't have to do all these other type of reviews. They already have all your information. If it's a new bank, 
They are going to ask you for some additional documentation. Like Althea said, they're going to ask for tax returns. They're going to ask for employee information, things like that. So those are things that you can get ready now so that you don't have to scramble around when you go talk to them. And um, I would just encourage you apply for everything you can, um, you know, work as many angles as you can. The best thing to do is get approved for all three or four or five. And then you can make a decision based on your financial situation and based on what um, terms and what interest rates and things like that are the best for your business. And um, I think that's kind of the, the rundown. I know we, we're getting a lot of questions on sole proprietors and um, kind of independent contractors of the gig economy. Um, I think that Althea can correct me um, if I'm wrong, which I, sometimes I am, that the gig economy and the sole proprietors, I think that that's coming out next week. So I don't think that the guidance has been issued yet. So a lot of people are saying, um, asking specific, very technical questions on that particular application. And I would say, um, I can't tell you now, but I can tell you on Thursday maybe or Wednesday when the information comes out. It's just like with the PPP, the banks got the information right before the program was available. So then they, that's kind of the guidance you should go by, not what's speculated in the newspaper, not what's put out you know, here or there. You should go by what the guidance is from SBA because that's what the lenders are gonna use. Um, and with that, I would just you know, save the questions. I would also encourage you guys, um, if you have existing commercial loans, existing SBA 7A or 504 loans, if you have existing disaster loans, request a deferment. They're offering a deferment on payments. That's a way for you to get cash flow back in your business. Um, so take, definitely take advantage of that. Um, I've seen some uh, businesses also requesting deferments from their landlords. They have not been as successful with that. Um, so I was happy to hear about the thing, the um, opportunity that opened for the airport and rent, because um, I think that's a huge fixed cost that's kind of taken off the plate for a couple months. Um, but I would say take advantage of some of these programs so that you can get that capital to hire your employees back, to pay your fixed costs and things like that. And just know that for SBDC, we're here to be a resource, but I would say we can't do everything alone. There's other groups, as Althea mentioned, like SCORE, Women's Business Centers, Prospera, Acción. There's a lot of other groups in the, in the community and we all work very collaboratively. Like at the end of the day, I'm more than likely, if I work with somebody, they work with two other groups too. So I would say just reach out to all those groups. I would say we're really good. I would, I would say we're the best, but um, all these groups are really good and everybody's doing what they can to help the local community. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Um, I, I have, well, I'm gonna let, Leanne's gonna search through anybody with raised hands and do some sorting through the chat, but I just wanna ask a question about PPP that I've heard a lot. Um, lots of small retail businesses, and I know this has happened in the airport, right? they uh, had to lay their employees off as business declined. And so now those folks are, are in the queue for unemployment. And if, if I apply for PPP and I want to, am I able to rehire those folks? Let's say I get approved for PPP, I'm making it up by May 1st. I could then decide I want to rehire my employees, keep them in the queue as I know that we're starting to ramp out of this crisis and hire them back. So how does that work if you've laid them off and you want to bring them back? Or are you, if you've already laid them off or furloughed them, most people have furloughed them, um, expecting to bring them back when the crisis is over. But how does that ebb and flow go? Because by the time the federal government gets us this money, um, many of our retail stores and restaurants and things have had no business for two months. Right, and that's exactly what the PPP was designed for, for employers to be able to bring back their employees. <clears throat> so that you've got the right idea that they, that is what it's for, and that's what we want uh, folks to do, is to rehire their employees. For, and the PPP makes uh, payroll funds available for two months uh, of payroll for them, going forward from the time they receive the funds. Yeah, and I was just going to say, too, um, you can't hire more people. So you can't go out and use PP to hire like 10 more people. You have to go by the numbers that you're providing as part of the application. And also, they do place a priority on you hiring back the people that you had to lay off. So I think if you do lay off people and they find another job or they're not interested to come back, you do have to document that. But you're basically going to be able to hire somebody else to replace them. So you don't worry about that but the, the consideration is that you try to hire more people hire the people back so that you can get back up and running right 
Okay, Leanne, I'll leave it to you um, to see if we have questions from folks. Yes, hi, this is Leanne. So um, in the chat, I think we've, um, for the most part, answered everything because I think they're doubled from the question and answer and Althea has been able to answer them in the question and answer. Um, so if you're interested in those, I can read through them, Commissioner, if you'd like, but everyone can also read her answers here. She wanted clarity. Um, Ro Ramona Hall asked um, if funds can be used to pay um, construction debt as I was in the process of wrapping up my construction on a new business location. Um, and then Althea asked, would you have to have had those had to have paid those expenses on a monthly basis. So um, I don't know if Ramona wanted to be unmuted. I can unmute you and um, you know you can yeah. clarify. Yeah, let's have that discussion. Okay. Let's see. So hi Ramona, so you've been um, unmuted. Thank you, can you hear me? Hello everyone, hello commissioner. Yes. Ms. Leela, Mr. Sola, Althea, and Mr. Van Hook. I was, and to answer your question, Althea, those expenses were being paid on a monthly basis. Okay, so then that's a bona fide use of idle funds. Okay, thank you. That's, that's the key. <laughs> if you would have had to pay them, but for the disaster, you would have paid them, and you can use the economic injury disaster loan to meet those obligations. They're four accounts payable. Uh, the, the loan is for accounts payable. Perfect. Thank you all. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Okay. And um, we have another question. How will you find out if you were denied an EIDL loan? Oh, we tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I you mean, will know. <laughs> you will know. You'll probably be hot and bothered by it. Um, but uh, you know, it is taking a while, right, to, to process those literally thousands of applications. Okay, perfect. And then I know we've answered this, but we will answer the question again. If uh, my primary business bank is backlogged or not accepting applications, where would my company find a list of participating SBA banks in Miami-Dade area? Right, and um, you know, at this point, most banks are able to do the loans. The question is, will they do the loan? So that's not a foregone conclusion that every bank is participating. Yeah. And some, go ahead, Brian. I see you want to. I was going to say, and you guys have kind of that lender match portal too, right? That yeah, you can we do. Up local banks. I, some people told me stop saying. I say used to say it was like Match.com for lenders, and they right. said, Brian, don't use that analogy anymore, please. <laughs> Find something yeah. else. Um, but chances are, you know. Um, you know, if the, if the bank has, you know, maybe uh, stores on the corner, you know, outlets on the corner, they probably are, you know, involved. But you'd have one of the ways you could look too is on their websites. Some of them have made it known. Hey, listen, if any lender has been knocking on your door trying to get your business, you might want to respond to them now and ask um, because uh, I I only know two folks who have gotten. Um, PPP loans so far. One is a business owner and one is a nonprofit, and they both got their PPP loans from the same somewhat small bank, local bank. So, um, you know, you know, I know that the tendency is to look for the big boys, but the big banks have millions of customers, millions, not just a few thousand, but millions of customers. So in some respects, they're not really the way to go on some of this stuff. And Althea, did those folks actually get the money or did they just get approved? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'll, I'll follow up. They, uh -huh. I think what they said were they were approved. So I don't know if they've gotten the money yet, but I, I'll ask that question. Yeah, because we have a lot of folks that got approved. And I would say the folks that got approved, just to re reiterate what Althea said, they were not big banks. They were smaller community banks, credit unions. Um, and well, we're like you guys at the business side. If I hear somebody's approving loans, I'm sending people that way. And it's just gonna be the same thing once money gets on the street. You should also talk to your fellow business you know, folks, folks that you know that are in the industry um, because they're gonna know who's making the loans. And also once money starts hitting the street, you're gonna hear really quick like who's the most popular banker in Miami. Um, so I would encourage you kind of track that as well. Okay. 
So um, I think Peter Amaro had um, a question and I was gonna unmute you, Peter, so you could ask your question. So you're unmuted, Peter, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, he's got some good ones. Let's see. Sorry, hold on one second. For some reason, I'm like, I have a glitch right now. I can't hear anyone right now. Okay, well, oh, I can read his I'll, question. Hold on now. Can you oh, hear me now? now? Now we can hear you. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Hello, Congresswoman, and thank you, Althea, Director, and Mr. Van Cook. Mr. Van Hook. I have two questions. I'm trying to understand um, the PPP program because, uh, as I understand it, the target is 75% of your staff, but we're also using 75% of the amount funded. So if you fall short of that 75% target that has been set, does, does any amount, for example, if I only achieve 45% of that staff that I had an average of in 2019, Will that portion be forgiven? Or does it okay. throw the whole thing out of whack and becomes disqualified? No, no, no. Okay, so um, in, in some of the language that I've uh, seen Treasury put out, um, your loan forgiveness will be reduced, is the way they put it. If you do not use uh, the monies in the proper ratios, right? Let's call it that. And, and, and it's, 75% of the money you get is expected to be used on payroll. So, and 25, up to 25% for the other allowable costs. So, and I think I'm used in this example uh, here, if you use 70% for payroll and 30% for the other costs, Five, it seems to me, five, based on what I've read, 5% will not be forgiven because you went over the 25% allocated for the other expenses and you didn't get there uh, all the way on 75% for the staff. Mm -hmm. But the point I would make to kind of follow up Althea is um, definitely pay attention to that ratio for what's forgiven, but also factor in that it's a 1% interest for two-year term. So also just, oh. it's, you want to get as much forgiven as you can, but then it's a 1% loan for a two-year term, whatever is not forgiven. So those are still pretty attractive terms, especially what we're dealing with right now. Right. So, so in, in, my, in my, my line of question, I'm, uh, the concern would be just not achieving the targeted amount. So to use a, a dollar figure, let's say that there's $1,000 of which 750 should be used towards payroll and 25% should be used towards the uh, acceptable expenses. If I come in and only use 50%, $500 on payroll, and don't even spend the rest of the 500 because that turns into a loan, is that acceptable? That I only achieve 50% of the, the targeted staff? Um, and when you say acceptable, what, do you, as, what are you doing with the other 50%? Are you giving it back? Is that I, I could doing? just return it. Okay. Um, Okay, well, let me start, I'm gonna start backwards and from your premise, right? Remember, the application goes in, your average monthly cost for payroll times 2.5. So that's the determinative amount for your loan. You shouldn't have if you do what, because the, the, the times two is the two months of payroll, right? Your average monthly payroll times two for two months, and the 0.5 is for that, those other expenses. Right? Understood. The other permitted expenses. Yeah, so, understood. So my question is if you fall short of keeping that targeted amount of staff, or is that just the ceiling? Is it not a disqualifier? Is it just a ceiling? So if you fall short of returning that staff, and I'll explain to you why I'm concerned. I'm concerned yeah. because in some cases, people feel that they're gonna be receiving more through unemployment to stay home than they're actually receiving through the pay that they've had right. up until you know March where they were laid off. Right. So it's hard to incentivize them to come back. So I'm concerned that if I start making these phone calls, 
and tell them to come off of the system that they've already been plugged into, which is the unemployment process, that they're going to see that there's a delay. And then on top of the delay that they are actually going to receive less money than they re or, or to receive through unemployment. For, right. And they're also going to receive it for a shorter time period. So right. that, that, that's what's leaning me towards being concerned about not meeting the threshold. And right. the question really is, is it, does it become a disqualifier because I fell short? Or does it simply just um, proportionally adjust to whatever it was that I was able to rehire and that person is forgiven and the rest of it is either a loan or return? Is that's that's where I'm I'm concerned about. You look. Do you want to answer anything of that, Brian? If not, I will. No, yeah. no, I don't. I don't want to touch that. No. Okay. Okay. No problem. Going to your expertise. But, understood. Understood. Yes. And this is this is a fascinating catch twenty two that we all find ourselves in with the unemployment compensation uh, that was part of the CARES Act as well. So I will piggyback on what Brian said before, which was that. Um, the PPP is designed to help you bring back employees, but if they don't want to come back and you want to hire other people, I believe, and I'd have to check, so don't, yeah. you know, I believe that's an acceptable use of the funds, meaning I don't think that we say, okay, you had Jane Doe and, and John Smith on the payroll. Now you have Conchita and Paul. It's the idea is that, you know, you have two employees, you tried to bring back those first two, they don't want to come back, but in order, but there's still two people out there who are unemployed who, you know, this is designed to put money in their pockets. So that's my take on it. But you know, that could, that just seems logical, but that doesn't make it so right. Yeah. And I would say for each business, you have to figure because everybody we can tell you what's eligible or what the rules say and things like that. But each business is unique and each situation is unique. And for some people, like you really want those people back. For other businesses, they want kind of folks, um, they need bodies, they need people to work, they need people doing stuff. So as Althea said, they're going to hire Conchita and Paul um, instead of Brian and Althea. Um, so I would say for you, you have to figure out what's, your, what, what's the need and what do you need. And that should be factored into your decision regarding PPP. And I, it's Eileen here, um, for those of you on the phone. Um, Congresswoman, this is an interesting question because I've heard of several states um, that are actually going to uh, begin to ask people, right? Because we don't want to fall in this trap of people not working when they could be working and staying on the role, the unemployment role. Um, and, and so some of them are actually over time going to get to the point where has your employer asked you, asked you back? Um, for, for all of us who are sitting here suffering in Florida, uh, we have the opposite problem. The state's unemployment system is right now not functioning at all. And, and most of your workers, unfortunately, those who have been able to apply have still not received um, a check, uh, mostly because the system has been, been crashing. So I don't think the state of Florida is able to deal with that question yet. Um, but my guess is eventually they will. And I don't know, Congresswoman, is has this been something that anyone has been talking about? They cannot about? ask that question. They cannot ask that question. Um, and, you know, the um, most people want to stay with their employer because of benefits. Remember, if you get unemployment insurance, uh, you're not going to get benefits unless you've been furloughed and your employer encourages you to go get the unemployment piece because they don't want you back at work right away. They may pay your benefits and you can take the unemployment uh, compensation. Um, mm. but, this, uh, but the whole point was to try to make people whole to help employers uh, to keep um, their employees. And there are two ways they could do that. One way is to bring them back by taking the PP. Uh, e program, getting into the small business program. The other way is to furlough them and then encourage them to apply for unemployment compensation, which will cover their wages. It's about $15 an hour if you add on the $600, if you look at the $600 a, a week that we're going to give people. Both ways, we're trying to keep the ties to the employer. So the employer has to really work with the employee and figure out what's best for both the business as well as the employee. Okay. 
I thank you for that. All right, so I'm gonna move, uh, thank you everyone. We're gonna move to um, Francisco Bali. Um, I'm gonna unmute you, Francisco, so you can go ahead and ask your question. You asked, uh, you had a question in the chat. So give me one second while I find you. Oh, I think Francisco came off, actually. He's no longer in here. Uh, let's move on. Well, let's, ask, it, he, let, let's ask his question, because I did okay. answer it in there. Okay, it's a good question. <clears throat> so uh, the funds can be used to cover expenses retroactive, retroactively back to February 15th. Is I thought it was only for eight weeks, starting with the date the loan is funded. Right. So um, there's two things going on, right? Um, the there's the payroll that must be used for eight weeks going forward from the time you get the money then on the 25 percent that you can use of the loan for other certain expenses those have to have been incurred before february 15th 2020 so if you just signed a new lease for example on april 1st you cannot use ppp money to pay your lease under that new agreement. But your old lease, you know, for example, if you got out of there and you didn't pay for March and you wanted to, you could. Okay, so it's, it's you have to have had these agreements and the obligation to pay them for rent, mortgage interest payments, and utilities prior to February 15th. But on the payroll portion, the minimal 75% for forgiveness you use for eight weeks going forward from the time you get the money. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I'm glad he asked of that. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Ricardo Gilmore. Are the SBA programs open to government or quasi-governmental agencies? And then I also um, I wanna see if Ricardo's on, if he has any other questions he'd like to ans answer, um, ask out loud. Okay, so this, the short answer to his question is no. The uh, PPP is not available to them, nor is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program available to local governments or even quasi-local, quasi-government. I, I appreciate that, uh, Ms. Harris, because I represent a lot of governmental entities and they're confused as to whether or not they could get in line with some of these benefits, so I appreciate that. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. And now we will move to, I'm sorry about this, uh, Michael Wascombe. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Michael and uh, see if he has any other questions that um, are unanswered for him. Hi, Michael, you're available. Oh, hi, yes, thank you. Um, I think you answered my questions through the conversation and the chat, very much appreciate it. Uh, the concern was that uh, some of the larger banks seem to be dragging their feet on processing um, the applications and if there are other options. Uh, and I think, Brian, your point was a good one about the uh, looking towards the smaller community banks uh, as an option. So very, very helpful discussion and just want to thank each and every one of you for the work you're doing. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly helpful. And thanks, oh. Commissioner, for pulling all of us together. Awesome. Thank you for your kind words. Um, you know, not to be sort of in defense of the banks, but, um, you know, uh, the great thing is that our government has uh, really worked hard to move quickly to be helpful to the American people. And the Congress did what they can do, which is pass that bill. And uh, the president did what he could do, which was sign it uh, and make it law. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that um, no one, not SBA, and, and we're in the disaster uh, loan giving business, but we, we were not prepared uh, infrastructurally or otherwise uh, in terms of uh, staff or our website, you know, crashed. We've had three iterations uh, in our efforts to take applications for the economic injury disaster loan. Um, you know, the banks just don't, they have an infrastructure, but $349 billion is a lot of cheesola. And, um, you know, we just all are struggling to catch up with the demand. And so um, I think part of uh, what you're saying, Michael and, and, and uh, Brian, 
about the uh, smaller uh, community banks, you know, there they overlooked folks who just don't have, you know, millions of customers asking them for uh, money. So they've been able to sort of fly under the radar and uh, be able to get the money out quickly because the, the demand on them hasn't been as great. But I, I'm really pleased and, and proud of the work that SBA is doing, that uh, government has uh, engaged in to try and meet the needs um, that we have as, as, a, as a country and an economy and the small businesses. So I do hope you will avail yourselves of the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. I know it's not as um, attractive sometimes as the PPP because it's a forgivable loan, uh, but the Economic Injury Disaster Loan has a great deal of flexibility in terms of what you can pay for with it. So, uh, and the term, you know, granted it is a, a loan at 3.75%, uh, but it is simple interest and it can carry a long enough term to make the, the payments manageable. Yeah, so, and I was going to say, like Althea said, um, I've worked on a couple of disasters, just like Althea, and I can tell you a lot of people right now are like PPP and definitely there's a portion that's forgivable and it's going to help you hire people back. You should definitely go for that program. But what I see every disaster is people don't, they wait until the last minute to apply for the economic injury or they don't think that they want it. But I can tell you that 3.75% up to 30 year term, that is really attractive when you can't apply anymore. You want that loan more than anything. So I would encourage you apply for everything look at it, but like, as I mentioned, the EIDL should be attractive to you for the interest rate that's lower, the 30 year term. And also because you can use all the stuff that you can't really put on the PPP under the idle. And right. it's a working capital loan. You only draw down what you need and you only pay interest on what you draw down. So it's a good, it's a good opportunity. Right. And, you know, uh, since you're here, Brian, maybe you could speak to this a little bit. Uh, and why I think it's so great that the Small Business Development Center is in the marketplace, because um, this requires, you know, to sort of manage your way out of this uh, economic morass uh, is going to require some strategy. And I think it's going to require some uh, different kinds of thinking about things. Um, it's going to require some forward thinking, uh, because we don't know what life is going to be like next. And um, you know, there are businesses, and if the recession of 2008 is any indication, there are businesses that will not survive this. And my question then becomes, you know, do you really want to take on debt if that's ultimately going to be you? I'm not suggesting that you not have optimism, that you not work hard for it, but, um, you know, that's a reality, and it would be helpful perhaps to you to think that through with some third party like the Small Business Development Center folks um, to throw your ideas around and, and really strategize about how to utilize this money, maximize its benefit to the business and, and help bring about a, a revival in the business. Yeah, and I would just say real quick because I want to save time at the end, but um, for businesses that were impacted by Zika, we canvassed around Wynwood, we canvassed around Miami Beach. The first thing we did was talk to those businesses and say, okay, you don't have foot traffic. Do you do catering? No, we don't do catering. Let's help you get catering uh, services set up so you can do things outside of Wynwood, outside of Miami Beach, that you can get revenue outside of that. I think that a lot of businesses and restaurants now, they're definitely going to set up delivery services. They're definitely going to set up gift cards. They're definitely going to improve their social media, improve their websites. Um, so I think those are things that groups like SBDC, we can help you with those strategies, but I would strongly encourage you guys also think about business resilience and business continuity. What happens is a hurricane comes, everybody spends the week or two weeks getting prepared, getting ready. Then you have a continuity plan, you throw it out. And then the next time it comes, you pick it back up. We work with businesses a lot. And I can tell you when we do a continuity plan for them, they want to talk about cybersecurity. They want to talk about theft. They want to talk about, you know, other, like sometimes, uh, active shooters, things like that. No business we'd ever worked with had ever asked for a pandemic plan. We knew where to get them. And uh, there's one on FEMA's website, it's really horrible for businesses, don't use it. But there's a lot of other ones that are really good. I guarantee you now you need to think about pandemic as part of your business continuity plan. Also, business interruption insurance. 
if you have business interruption insurance, if you have a policy for pandemics, let me know. Please put it in the chat because the um, insurance companies stopped covering business interruption insurance for pandemics starting in 2003. Um, a lot of businesses don't have that, but now you're going to try to get your business interruption and you can't get it because it was excluded. So those are things that you should look at now for the next time and be prepared. Um, so I would just kind of throw that out there. I don't want a next time. Yeah. <laughs> All um, right. Um, I think we probably have to close out Q&A. If uh, we missed any questions, we're going to keep uh, copies of the chat and all the questions and we can feed them in and get back to you tomorrow. Um, I'll also email, I know there's some folks on the phone, we'll um, try to email you any of the links that were sent here, but I think we can turn it over to our Congresswoman. Maybe she can give us a little bit of what might be next. Um, not just for small businesses, but in particular of interest to us is um, airports and airport businesses because one of the things we have learned in, in this um, little group of ours here with the airport is um, the under 500 number is very hard because every now and then you have a bookstore in 12 or 13 different airports and the next thing you know you're over 500 but you're just 50 people in, in our airport and there was not a hospitality carve out for airports in the way that there were for hotels. So that same sort of little bookshop in a hotel staffed by hotel workers, they could have more than 500 employees, but, but our folks in the airport cannot. So Congresswoman, just let us know what's next, not just for airports and small business, but for, for all the rest of us too, as human beings. Well, um, we are working on another bill. Obviously, we've done these bills very uh, fast, so we've left some things out. Um, this is a very impressive uh, um, uh, effort by the Small Business Administration to give everybody the information. And obviously, there are alternatives here because it was existing platforms. We use the unemployment. Uh, insurance system of the states. And some states, like us, like ours, were not prepared in any way. They had a system to basically deny people, and now they've got to say yes, yes, yes. So we put trillions of dollars, basically, into the system. We are going to go back to Congress. We'll be going back to put more money into this small business program that forgives and turns a loan into a grant. So that's one of the things that we're gonna do. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to put more money into state and local governments, particularly in cities that are under 500,000. Uh, Florida has no cities over 500,000 except for that Jacksonville. So we're totally discriminated against uh, in the money that was put out for uh, large cities. Uh, and finally, we're going to put more money into our hospitals. They're all bleeding money. Um, because they're, they're taking care of COVID-19 patients, but not the other people that normally they get their income from, surgeries and things that can be put off for a while, but not forever. So uh, we'll be doing those things. I have specifically asked for an airport ex exemption. Whether we're able to negotiate that in the next bill, I do not know, but I... Um, I have asked for that exemption within the hospital, the hospitality um, uh, section. Uh, and we'll see whether we're able to get it this time. There are some other things that we wanted to deal with. For example, Goodwill in Miami has 3,100 employees. They've had to furlough 2,800 of them. And they're not eligible for a small business loan because they're over 500. They're a not-for-profit. Obviously, they employ people that other people don't necessarily are willing to employ. And we would like to, to see if we can find a way so that they could come in and get a small business loan uh, to take care of those employees that are furloughed. Uh, so there are lots of, when you do this kind of big legislation, you need to make technical corrections. And that's what we're going to try to do and of course there are lots of things we need to do on the health side as well but this is an example this um this session is an example of where we're all pulling together because the only way we're going to get out of this is if 
federal leaders and state leaders and local leaders uh, like you, Eileen, are all pulling in the same direction. And if we have outstanding airport directors that really care about the businesses uh, at the airport and about their employees, as well as federal employees, um, we're all in this together and we're gonna get through this together. So thank you very much. Welcome. I learned a lot actually. Well, there we go, see, it's a good, it's a good day. All from a laundry room too. Yes. Who knew? Um, Mr. Sola, you want to say a few words? Most of these folks are, are your friends and colleagues. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you to the Congresswoman and uh, obviously the SBA and, and FIU. The, it, it, we're in unprecedented times, but I think we have to recognize the efforts of the Congress to, to do something at lightning speed and, and the will to go back and maybe capture some of those businesses or organizations that were left out is something that's to be commended as well too. We, are, we, we as a community have to figure out how we're gonna help not just our concessionaires and everyone else who's working at this airport, but the entire community is, is being impacted. So I know through your efforts, Commissioner, we've had a couple of legislation, legislation, legislative items that we still have to work through. Uh, you just, the board just approved a massive, this is probably the best way to describe it, relief plan for all the concessionaires and all the other operators at, at the airport. And, which, would, which is basically a drain of the tune of $64 million every three months of the airport. But we recognized we had to do it and the leadership of the board to do it because it was the only way we were gonna be able to keep these firms still engaged at this airport. So I know that the mayor and the board and Congress are committed to continue to work and try and help these firms come back up to speed when, when airlines start flying again. I'll tell you, I, and I speak to American Airlines on a daily basis and then our other airline partners, cargo is doing very well but the the terminal and the movement of traffic down significantly but the the airlines are ready to start flying again in the volumes as soon as we can get this virus under control i mean we're taking measures you, you may have heard today during the conference call we're buying thermal thermometers throughout and deploying them throughout the airport so that people feel comfortable the airlines are doing significant amount of disinfecting uh, of the of the planes in between flights so a lot is being done to try and gain that confidence of the flying public to be able to get back on those planes and, and conduct your business so thank you for i have to tell you me myself i've i've learned a lot from this from this workshop as well things that you didn't know how to fill in those gaps so it's it's a valuable experience so thank you very much you know i um i flew two weeks ago and on an american airlines plane to washington because we had to take the boat on the cares act and um, all the members didn't go, but enough of us had to go to make up a quorum so that we could pass. And uh, three of us were on an American Airlines. They separated us out. Uh, um, and uh, I probably will have to do it again. And everybody said, you're taking a risk. Listen, we're doing our jobs. All of us are doing our jobs. True. Okay, everybody, we've been on for an hour and 20 minutes. Thank you so much for joining. I hope um, I learned things. And I hope everyone else did too. Um, Mr. Van Hook, Brian, um, I'm sure you're going to get several emails as we use continue as all of our small businesses continue to rely on you as kind of our personal concierge uh, through this process. And, and we appreciate that. I also in the chat, I put another link to call to what's called accesshelps.org. Um, that is a great link, um, particularly for your employees. It uses common language. You know, I am a person who can't pay my electric bill. I am a person like this. So there's a section for your employees that might be helpful to share with them. There is also a section that is for small business owners and they also provide additional resources on there that we haven't had the time to discuss tonight. Uh, so anyway, thanks everybody. Um, Althea, Brian, Lester, Donna, um, and everyone, I appreciate um, all of your efforts because it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take the federal government, the county, and all of the business owners taking advantage of every dollar everybody has out there um, to get our, our economy. And of course, in this case, our airport back in tip top running shape. So bye everyone. Bye. Thank you, be safe guys. Thanks.